All right, our next speaker is Nick Redfern. He is an author, lecturer, journalist, who writes about a wide range of unsolved mysteries, including Bigfoot, UFOs, the Loch Ness Monster, alien encounters, and gun metal conspiracy. Nick has nearly 40 books that have been published internationally, including Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, The, Weird World, the World's Weirdest Places, the Pyramids and the Pentagon, The Real Men in Black, and The NASA Conspiracies. Nick has appeared on numerous television shows and networks that include Fox, The History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, UFO Hunters, VH1's Legends Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth About UFOs and Paranormal, and Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive, as well as several others. He resides in Arlington and has three new books due out later this year. Today, he will be speaking on the strange creatures of Texas and will have several of his books uh, over there to choose from at his uh, booth. Let's welcome Nick Redfern. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, as Brian said, I'm going to be talking about strange creatures of Texas today. If you can't understand me, I know I've got a funny accent, so... Uh, I'll try and keep it slow. Um, Texas has a lot of weird creatures running around, flying around, swimming around that people don't know about. Um, and we think of sort of lake monsters, we think of the Loch Ness Monster, we think of Bigfoot, we think of something that lives in the Pacific Northwest forests, and we think of weird flying things. People think about stuff like Mothman. Well, all these types of creatures reside or have been seen in the state of Texas over the years and over the decades. Um, a lot of these kinds of reports have just sort of gone under the radar. Uh, the cases have been forgotten, but there's some sort of really classic, interesting ones that have covered the, the last sort of 60 or 70 years and that sort of easily rival things like Mothman reports, Bigfoot in the Pacific uh, Northwest, uh, lake monsters in Scotland, that kind of thing. So what I'm going to do for you today is give you sort of a broad, wide spectrum of cases and reports of creatures that have been reported throughout Texas. And as I said, to keep it sort of varied, lake monsters, flying creatures, hairy wild men, and just about anything and everything else in between. So we'll start with the one that probably most people know about. Now, if you talk about the Chupacabra in Texas, most people will be familiar with the image of what looks like a large, hairless, rat-like dog. And although that's the sort of the, the image in Texas we have today, a lot of people don't realize that, oh, excuse me, a lot of people don't realize that that is the original Chupacabra the, the Chupacabra mystery surfaced on Puerto Rico in the 1990s and uh, Chupacabra is a Spanish term meaning goat sucker and it got the name because starting in around about 1994-1995 people began reporting all across Puerto Rico um, small farm animals killed and drained of blood and they had these two weird puncture wounds to the necks which gave it sort of like a vampire type um, mystique, if you like. And so the term chupacabra was created. Essentially, the goats were being sucked of blood, and that's where the name came from. And that is pretty much how the witnesses described the Puerto Rican chupacabra, sort of like a bipedal, almost reptile-type creature with a vicious-looking row of spikes down its head and neck, kind of like a, almost like a, a mohawk, if you like. And, um, and running on two legs. So that's very, very different to what people report seeing in Texas today. And I'll come to the Texas one shortly, but it's kind of important to demonstrate how and why this hairless dog-like animal in Texas became known as the Chupacabra. And basically, the, as I said, it's, it's mainly the the kind of attacks that these creatures carried out on Puerto Rico that became translated into the United States, not so much the way the animal looks. And I've been on many expeditions to Puerto Rico investigating the Chupacabra, and on each occasion I've heard these stories where 
the farm animals, goats, chickens, things like this, as I said, have got two puncture wounds to the neck, or sometimes one to the stomach, and there are claims that the liver has been removed and no other organs at all. Now, if that's true, and they're doing it in this sort of very cunning, stealthy way, that suggests a high degree of intelligence is involved. Um, and so whatever the Puerto Rican chupacabra is or isn't, it's sort of a distinctly unique animal, which for the most part, <coughs> excuse me, for the most part, hasn't been seen anywhere else. But keep that image in mind, because that sort of then takes us to the Texas version, which is a very, very different one, even though it shares an identical name. Now that's, that's the skull of one of the animals that's become known as the Texas Chupacabra. Uh, that was given to me a guy, by a guy named Walt Andrus, and Walt used to be the director of a group called the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, which is still around today. It's, well, I think it's actually the United States' biggest UFO research group, and um, Walt was actually given that skull about six or seven years ago. And he gave it to me, I think, 1998, 1999, something like that. And he got it from a rancher just outside of San Antonio who'd shot the animal on his property. And he described it as being looking like a large dog-like animal, four legs, long ratty tail, and just, just very strange looking. So he shot it and killed it. And that's the skull of the animal. And as you can see, um, Got long teeth, uh, typical sort of canine um, face, skull, nothing particularly strange about it. And DNA analysis was taken on this and it was shown that the DNA was 90% plus um, found to be coyote. And there was some evidence of like uh, just regular wild dog in the, in the DNA as well. But the predominant DNA was coyote. Now, People have said, well, what are these creatures? What are these Texas Chupacabra? How did they become known as the Tex Texas Chupacabra? And, and even why did they take on that name? Well, when we look at, as I said, the Puerto Rican reports, what we find is like a, a bipedal creature with spikes running down its head and neck and greenish reptilian, which looks nothing like that at all. But the one common factor was that ranchers in Texas were reporting their animals attacked in a very similar fashion to the Puerto Rican animals. That's to say, bite wounds to the neck, um, and there were stories about the blood being sucked or lapped in some cases, and there's a lot of controversy about whether these, these so-called Texas chupacabra has actually ever sucked blood. Um, which is highly unlikely, uh, almost to a 100% you know, degree. The idea that they might have lapped blood, that, that's not impossible. Um, but it was the fact, as I said, that they were attacking farm animals and very often not eating them. You know, in the wild, um, it's food's the most predominant thing that, that animals need. And, but in many of these attacks done by the Texas chupacabra, the animals weren't eaten, weren't carried away, they were just left on the ground with these bite marks. And somebody then went sa said, well, this kind of sounds like the Puerto Rican chupacabra. And in no time at all, you had this translation from Puerto Rico to Texas of a name, but a completely different creature. Now, the skeptics would say that this creature, because it's sort of 90% um, coyote DNA, well, it's just a coyote and nothing else. But that actually isn't the case. They're not, as some people have claimed, unknown animals. They're, they're not. If anybody tells you that these creatures are unknown, they're not. Um, in most cases, the DNA is sort of close to 100% coyote. Sometimes it's crossed with a wild wolf. There have been a couple of reports of um, DNA coming from a Mexican wolf and also regular dogs as well. Now, so we know what the animals are, but they look very, very strange. They actually do have some very weird characteristics to them. Um, for example, I'm sure most of you have seen these on the TV. They look completely hairless, or they are completely hairless. And the skeptics have said, well, they're just suffering from mange. Um, mange being a skin condition caused by a mite where it causes hair loss. Well, generally, mange doesn't ca cause 100% hair loss in the animal. Actually, has, the animal has patchy hair, 
It also causes intense irritation to the point where the animal sort of scratches itself because it's in so much pain. Imagine something like when you're a kid and you have chicken pox and you just itch and itch and itch. It's kind of like that. But out in the wild, they scratch and itch to such a degree that infection sets in and the animals often die. But what's happening with these Texas chupacabra is that we're not seeing the patchy fur, we're not seeing evidence of the irritation, the scratches, the infection setting in from scratches. What we're seeing is what appear to be coyotes that for some strange reason are developing in a completely hairless fashion. And nobody seems to know why that is. And um, in many of the cases, they do have a, a very, very slight fuzz but in many cases, there's nothing at all. So it doesn't seem like regular mange. Even if it is mange, it's some sort of strange offshoot. Now, there are other issues as well. In some of the cases, they, the top jaw is like a huge overbite of about an inch long. Um, normally, coyotes, they have like a uniform um, top jaw and bottom jaw that joins together. Some of these cases, I said, it's like an inch to an inch and a half long. So it's, it's a significant overbite. Um, there are other reports, and you can actually see photographs on the internet, where on their hind legs, they seem to have these weird pouches. Nobody can really explain what these pouches are. And unlike reg regular coyotes, these hunt during the day. Um, you know, you often see coyotes crossing the road, particularly in these sort of wilds of Texas late at night. But these animals very often hunt during the day. And one of the reasons why um, so many have been shot and killed is because they don't have a fear of people. When they see people, they just sort of stand there and look at them. And that's the same as on ranches. That's why so many ranches have been able to shoot them, because these creatures are roaming around during the day. And when you know, the, the ranch is 30 feet away from them, they're not running off. So there appear to be, if you like, physical changes in the animals, but also sort of psychological and mental changes as well to where their attitude to us changes. And um, I actually got one report, a very sort of creepy one, actually wasn't from Texas, but it was up in Oklahoma. Um, there have been a number of reports of, from Oklahoma, particularly around the town of Norman. And um, I got one story where a guy got out of his truck and saw three of these things stood together and then they suddenly sort of separated into like a triangulation around him and he actually thought they were sort of ready to attack him and he just backed away and got back in his truck and they sort of stood their, stood their ground for five minutes or so and then wandered off but he got a really sort of creepy feeling that they were sort of triangulating him and just were literally figuring out how to take him down which is you know sort of pretty disturbing now the big question, of course, is, well, what's going on? Is it some sort of spontaneous mutation? Is it something else? Um, Ken Gerhard, good friend of mine, Ken sort of speculated on the possibility that we might be seeing something that's been caused by the effects of pollution. Um, Ken's looked at the association between the key sites in Texas where these creatures have been seen in relation to certain sort of factories and power plants that are putting out a lot of pollution and um, one of the theories is that it's caused the creatures either to mutate or it's like a spontaneous mutation of some kind and and that does happen occasionally that nature throws you know strange things in things into the mix for example um, England where I'm originally from I grew up um, in a county called Staffordshire and about 80 or 90 years ago, uh, 30 or 40 wallabies escaped from a private zoo. And because there's just no way you're going to be able to round up 30 or 40 wallabies, you know, they just sort of bound around at 30 or 40 miles an hour. Um, and so they've lived in the wilds of England for about 80 years, and now it's like the descendants of the descendants of the descendants. And in that 80 years, if you see a regular uh, wallaby, a picture of a wallaby in Australia, they've got like a short, tight fuzz hair but because England gets pretty cold most of the year round just across 80 years their coats have developed to where they're like this thick they're like super thick coats so that's that's nature changing things in just 80 years to cope with a different environment that could be happening with these Texas creatures but the big question is why it's happening so quickly um, 
the one question that the skeptics are unable to answer about these creatures is if it's just mange and nothing else, why didn't we get lots of reports of these, say, in the 1980s, the 70s, the 60s, and as long as people have seen coyotes? They've really only started to be seen, the hairless ones, in the 2000s and onwards. So, again, this is an important factor. We're seeing a new variation on a regular species. Now, giant birds in the skies, um, probably can't see that too well, but that's uh, like a cracked open egg and a bunch of guys stood next to, uh, to the egg. I'm sure that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, it's actually not too much of an exaggeration. That's actually a life-size replica of the largest bird that um, ever lived. And it's called Argentivus, and it actually had a, a wingspan up to 23 feet. And uh, we actually have fossilized remains of this particular bird, and you can see how big it grew to. But I mean, it, it became extinct um, literally millions and millions of years ago in the Jurassic era. But uh, it, it demonstrates how big birds can grow. Now, the fact that we've got fossils, you know, is interesting from millions of years ago. But what's more amazing is that we actually get a lot of reports today of people seeing something that looks like that, sort of a bird with a wingspan of anywhere from sort of 15 to 20 feet. Now, in theory, the creatures could exist because we know in history they existed, that's one of them. The problem, of course, is in a highly populated 21st century, how could they exist and not be found, identified, captured or killed? Well, of course, the big question is it would be extremely difficult for them to live but nevertheless, people report them. And, and to go back to Ken Gerhard, um, Ken wrote a book a few years ago called Big Bird, which is a very sort of appropriate title. And it deals with sightings of anomalous large birds, not just in the US, but around the world. And Ken um, placed a lot of emphasis on Texas. And he's got a lot of reports from down by the, uh, particularly San Antonio, down towards the Mexico border is where we get a lot of these reports. And um, in some respects, they sound like the Native American stories of Thunderbirds. Now, the, the Thunderbirds were a large, um, essentially like a, large, a huge bird in their culture. Um, and the, the name the Thunderbird actually comes from the beating of the wings. It was supposed to sound like thunder. Now, of course, many people just relegate these stories to, you know, to, to mythology or folklore. But if you try telling that to the witnesses, you get a bit, very different answer. And, um, and Ken has literally got dozens of stories, and I'm sure he still gets them regularly now, but dozens of stories of people seeing these huge birds just sort of soaring through the skies of Texas. And I've spoken to a lot of these witnesses, and it's very, very difficult to write off the testimony. Um, you know, they come across as just regular, credible people. So, as I said, the idea that something could, like that could exist isn't at all impossible because things like that did exist. Where could they live? That's, you know, that's the bigger problem. Um, I do find it interesting that a lot of reports come from the Texas, Mexico area, particularly in the mountainous terrains. And that would actually make a lot of sense because something like that 23 foot wingspan, you know, it's not going to take off from the car park outside here. Many of these birds, and, and also things like um, the, from, uh, like the uh, pterosaurs from the Jurassic period, like pterodactyls, there's a lot of theories that they actually lived on higher ground and they would have to sort of literally launch themselves off cliff tops to sort of be able to fly in the thermals that they might not actually have the strength and ability to take off from a flat surface, like, a, like an aircraft would on a runway. They would have to sort of take off like a hand glider would and the, you know, then you would catch the air. So again, it's not impossible that these things could exist if they are existing in mountainous terrains that are not well-traveled, you know, not many people around, and most people who might see them might not want to talk about it for fear of ridicule. So in that sense, I don't rule it out. Um, in fact, I don't rule it out at all because of the credibility of the witnesses. But we could be looking at another angle as well, which sort of takes it down a more paranormal angle, if you like, where you know people suggest that these things are sort of 
flitting in and out of other dimensions from somewhere else. And uh, I know Ken's got a few reports like that. So I'm not entirely sure if these reports, at least, should fall into the realm of cryptozoology. Cryptozoology is the study of unknown animals. Um, but occasionally you get these crossover cases where it seems to have a few more sort of supernatural aspects to it. And, and maybe that's where, you know, we, with these cases, that's what we get with the big bird cases. But, you know, it could still go down the physical path. And, um, and we're still getting reports, so there's, there's clearly a real phenomenon. Now, that's a photograph of me taken in uh, last year at the Mothman Festival in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. They've got this huge um, stainless steel model of, of Mothman in the town, which is, which is pretty cool. I guess, it's, as you can see, it's probably about 10 feet tall with the wings and the glowing red eyes as well. And it's sort of pretty good, uh, you know, image of Mothman. And Mothman was this creature that was seen in the town of Point Pleasant in the mid to late 60s. and um, was associated with uh, the collapse of the town's silver bridge, which killed dozens of people when, who were driving across the bridge at the time. And it was made into a movie in 2001 with Richard Gere, which was basically, it, it sort of told the story, it sort of summarized the facts, and obviously being a no, uh, movie, you know, it sort of took a few liberties as well. But it's, it's a pretty good atmospheric film. And, um, you, but the, I guess the best, um, treatment of the story is John Keel's book, The Mothman Prophecies. Well, as I said, this was in the 1960s, but long before uh, Mothman was on the scene, there was a creature known as the Houston Batman, which was seen in Houston. And um, the Houston Batman, it kind of sounds like something straight out of a comic book, but um, not for the witnesses, at least. Um, this was the summer of 1953, and one particular area of town where the, uh, the houses, the homes, the apartments, they didn't have really much air conditioning. And um, three people in particular stayed up late one night, just couldn't sleep, it was just too hot. And they were sitting on the porch and they saw something very much like that, literally sort of spring into view, uh, sort of looming on a, a large branch of a tree. And it was described as humanoid with a large pair of wings. Now, what that should be, you know, nobody really knows, I mean, the, if you look throughout history, you can find stories of winged humanoids, things like harpies, gargoyles, that kind of thing. And maybe things like the, the Mothman and the Houston Batman, they could be sort of modern incarnations of these older mysteries. The big question is, what are they? Again, are they something that's flesh and blood? Are they something supernatural? Right. We don't really know. But one of the strange things about these creatures is that very often, the wings aren't in the proportion that you would expect for to allow something of this size to get into the air. For example, you have humanoid forms like that, where the wingspan may be only sort of seven to eight feet. You know, if a human had wings, we wouldn't be able to take to the air with wings that are just out to here. You know, it, the proportion of the weight of a person would require much larger wings. So that's one of the stranger aspects about them. But um, these reports in Houston, they still continue. Again, to go back to Ken Gerhard, Ken got, wrote a book a couple of years ago called Encounters with Flying Humanoids, and he includes an entire section in his book on the Houston Batman. And he talks about latter-day sightings in the area as well. And I got one about three or four years ago from someone who'd seen almost, something almost identical to the Houston Batman around about 2006. And this was on one of the highways um, between Austin and San Antonio. And the guy described it as pretty much like a, a large man-like figure, these huge leathery type wings. Um, again, the witnesses come across totally credible and it's difficult to sort of reconcile it with the, the fact that they have actually seen that. You know, there's, there's not really any way you can mistake a large humanoid figure with wings for anything else. You know, it's, it, it's either that or it's nothing at all. Now, if we move on to Bigfoot, as I mentioned at the beginning, that very often people think of Bigfoot and they think of the Pacific Northwest forests and snow and Alaska and Canada and things like that. Um, but there's a long tradition of Bigfoot reports in Texas. 
and um, you can find reports actually not too far from here around the Trinity River there have been a lot of reports and um, not too far from Ennis places like that um, one of the places where I've been on many occasions to investigate Bigfoot reports is a, is a place called the Big Thicket. Now the Big Thicket is a large, area, very, very large area of forest, um, not too far from the city of Houston. And um, there are a lot of reports of Bigfoot type creatures having been made in the Big Thicket. And a friend of mine named Rob Riggs wrote a book about all this. And if you want to get a hold of it, it's called In the Big Thicket. And it's like a 200 page book all about these Texas Bigfoot reports in that particular area. And um, as I said, I've been down there a number of occasions and people say to me, you know, well, how could something sort of six to seven feet tall remain hidden from us? Well, when you get to the big thicket and you actually sort of realize the sheer scale and density of it, then you also begin to realize how, you know, nature can hide things. I mean, first time I went down there was like the summer it was like 100 degrees and you just get bitten to pieces and cut to pieces going through the trees so in other words most people just don't bother going in there because they have no reason to so in other words that would make it much easier for creatures that don't want to be found to hang out specifically in the areas where for example they know people for the most part don't go but um, on one of the occasions I was down there, this was a, actually a nighttime vigil we went on for a weekend. Um, although I didn't hear it, one of the uh, team members, um, she actually heard something making a very loud, like a gorilla-like um, grunt. And it was sort of almost perceived as like a, like a threat. Um, you know, just sort of a warning to sort of say, keep, keep away, that kind of thing. And, um, you get a lot of accounts like that. Rob, for example, has found reports dating back to the 60s, and then the more he looked into it, he found reports from the 50s and the 40s, and then sort of going back to the turn of the century. So, in other words, these reports have existed for a long, long time. And I guess what's the strangest story from the Big Thicket is not of Bigfoot sightings, but there have been a number of reports, and they haven't really been investigated to a great degree, of people who claim to have seen what look like surviving pockets of ancient Native Americans. Now, when I, say, when I say ancient Native Americans, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a large population of Native Americans still in the US today. But we're talking about ones who still seem to, you know, sort of dress and use the, the same type of weapons as sort of two, three hundred years ago. In other words, they've become isolated and, and, in, and in these pockets and literally, for all intents and purposes, as they were, as I said, a couple of hundred years ago, not changed at all. And um, there's actually a very strange story of a guy who got shot at. He saw one of these guys uh, on a horse and it looked just like, you know, somebody who would, if you had sort of an old uh, photograph of a Native American on a horse sort of 100, 120 years ago. And he suddenly heard this huge like noise, something hit the, the tree next to him and it was like a crudely carved arrow and he just sort of got out the area immediately so there's a lot of a lot of weird stuff going on in the big thicket which sort of suggests it's almost it's almost kind of out of time with all the different creatures it's got there now as well as bigfoot reports in texas um we also get what i guess you would call wild man type reports and talking about something more along the lines of like a Neanderthal man or a Cro-Magnon man, like a primitive human, but still covered in hair. And if you go back and look at some of the 19th century newspaper reports, this was long before the term Bigfoot was coined. The term Bigfoot wasn't created until the late 1950s. And people think, well, you know, why wasn't it seen before? Well, it actually was, but it's just the name that didn't exist. Um, the name Sasquatch, I think, goes back to something like 1920, Larry, is it? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but even before that, they had reports of what became known as wild men. You know, if you do a, say, a Google search, newspaper reports, 19th century wild men, you'll find literally dozens of accounts of people seeing these creatures. And, and in many cases, they do sound like Bigfoot. But there are other cases that they sound so, like something more like this, like a something that looks far more clearly more humanoid but still covered in hair 
For example, there's a famous case of what's become known as the wild man of the Navidad. And um, this has like a long tradition. Again, it could be of a Bigfoot type creature or ongoing colonies of Bigfoot type creatures. But some of the early reports described, again, something that sounded more human-like. And in one case, the creature was reportedly seen carrying a club, uh, like a, a fashioned wooden club. Um, which again suggests some sort of fairly high degree of intelligence. And so, what do I think they are? I mean, maybe we're dealing with two different types of phenomena. You know, you do find these large sort of hairy ape type reports, and then we do find these um, more humanoid ones. Um, now, for example, you know, we can find this all around the world, uh, where we get reports of wild men um, versus classic ape type creatures. For example, in China there's the Yeren, um, Australia has the Yowie, the US has Bigfoot. These are all traditional large ape type animals. But there's one in Russia that lives in the wilds of Russia known as the Almasty. And in many of the reports that actually does sound more like a, a very, very primitive human that may have survived from, from prehistoric times. Um, and I don't rule out the idea that there could be isolated pockets of, of wild creatures, wild men, wild women, wild families, you know, just hiding out, oblivious to what's going on around them. You know, a lot of people think today's world's well-traveled and fully explored, but the, there are a lot of places that people just don't go to, you know, like the wilds of Siberia and the mountainous areas and some of the, you know, the jungles of South America. Um, there could be certain things living out there that you know, we just don't know about. Um, like for example, on the island of Sumatra, we have reports of this creature known as the Orang Pendek, which is like a, a three to four foot tall ape-like animal, but it reportedly walks completely upright like a human. And people have sort of, who've seen it have said, you know, it sort of stops them in the tracks. You don't expect to see something that's ape-like, but walking like a man. And there are actually a few reports of people claim to have seen these creatures carrying spears. So again, are we dealing with something that's an ape or is it a human? Or is it somewhere in between? Or more incredibly, could it be a completely unclassified type of human? Could some of these Texas ones, these primitive people, could it actually be something that has, we haven't classified? You know, we're Homo sapien. You know, before us there was Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon man and so on. Maybe some of these are one that literally has not yet been identified at all. Now, kind of touching on the, the sightings of the big birds, um, we get into even more controversial areas when we start talking about um, people who claim to have seen the closest thing you could imagine to like a pterodactyl. Um, now, pterodactyls became extinct tens and tens of millions of years ago, um, right around the same time as the dinosaurs. They're essentially flying reptiles. Um, but again, people report seeing things like this, and particularly so down by the Texas-Mexico border. So one of the big questions or the intriguing issues is whether or not the things that people have seen like this down on the Texas-Mexico border are actually the same things as the big birds that people report, but they're kind of getting confused. Maybe somebody's mistaken something like this for a big bird or vice versa, we just don't know. But I don't think it's coincidence that both of these sort of anomalous large creatures, flying creatures, are seen on the Texas-Mexico border. And again, there are some reports that suggest flesh and blood animals. There are others that are sort of have vague paranormal aspects to them. So again, it's whether or not these cases should fall under the domain of cryptozoology or they should be something for paranormal investigators to look into. But again, Ken Gerhard's got literally, he showed me once his, you know, the, all the case files he'd got. I mean, it's like, it may be in the hundreds now, it's certainly in the, you know, the many dozens. And um, Ken's investigated and interviewed a lot of these people and, and again they come across as highly credible um, but it, it's just the nature of the case you know you imagine driving down a near the Texas border and you see something that looks just like a pterodactyl straight out of Jurassic Park or something like that sort of soaring overhead that's exactly what people are saying they're seeing 
Now, I've investigated over the years a number of reports of what we would call lake monsters in Texas. And um, yeah, I guess when people think about lake monsters, they think of like, the Loch Ness Monster or Ogo Pogo or Champ, which are some of the more well-known ones um, in, in Scotland, Canada, the United States. Um, the ones I've investigated in the United, excuse me, in Texas, in some of the Texas lakes and also in the Trinity River, suggest to me that what people might be seeing in some cases, what's called an alligator gar. That, that's an alligator gar. You can see how long that is. The guy sat behind it. And so that compared to him, I would say that's probably about 11 feet long. Now, I've got some reports where people claim to have seen what I'm pretty sure are alligator gar, but they said they were like 17 to 18 feet long. Now, if that's true, that would be pretty incredible. And I guess, you know, if you're sort of fishing in the river and you kind of see this alligator gar coming charging towards you at 18 feet long, you're probably not going to argue or disagree that it's a monster. You're probably just going to get out of the way. Um, so I guess, you know, it depends how we define the term monster even. But um, I think in many of these cases, it's an honest case of misidentification of an animal that is far bigger than it should normally grow to, suffering from something like gigantism, as it's known. Um, and sometimes certain fish, for example, they can grow bigger and bigger according to their environments. Um, they can literally just keep on growing. So, you know, in one sense, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these lake monster reports are something along these lines. Now, one of the weirder things I've looked into is reporting wolves in Texas. Um, that's an old 19th century painting. What you've got there is um, a saber-toothed cat attacking a, a, like a, a bison or a buffalo. And, um, and you have the wolf uh, snarling. I know it's kind of cut up in the, the way the picture's presented. Um, and the, but the wolf in the picture is what's known as a dire wolf. Now, the dire wolf reported became extinct tens and tens of thousands of years ago, but the dire wolf was a very large wolf. You imagine something like today's wolf, but sort of half the size bigger and packing a huge amount of muscle. That's what dire wolves look like. And they had, um, they had a bite power 125% greater than today's wolves. You know, they, they would just crush their prey. And there are actually a number of reports in the Dallas, um, I think it's the Dallas Morning News, but one of the local Dallas reports from 1905, where a rancher just outside Dallas shot two of these large wolves. They were described as being like the size of a small pony. Now, if that's not an exaggeration, you would be talking about probably something like, you know, this high, which would be incredible for a wolf. So one of the theories is that perhaps in certain pockets in the United States, the dire wolf still exists, that it actually never did become extinct. And this sort of then translates into an even more controversial area, that of not just um, strange unknown wolves, but actually werewolves. Now, when people talk about werewolves, you know, they think of like the traditional folklore, or Hollywood imagery, of somebody spouting fur and fangs at the full moon and killing a bunch of teenagers in the woods or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. That's, <laughs> that's um, sort of the typical scenario that people have. Now, shape-shifting or lycanthropy um, has traditions that go back thousands of years, the idea that people could transform into wolves. Now, if you look at the, the body of reports, in the United States today, there are actually literally hundreds of reports of people claim to have seen werewolves. A friend of mine, Linda Godbury, she's written five books on the subject, um, including The Beast of Bray Road, which some of you may have heard of, and one called Hunting the American Werewolf. And her books are filled with reports of people seeing for what you would call a werewolf, like a, a giant wolf standing on its hind legs, just like in, in that old drawing there. And, um, but Linda hasn't got... I think she may have one case where somebody claims that the creature um, was actually a human that turned into a, a wolf. Every single other case, and every single one I've got, is of just of a creature that is, looks like a wolf but walks on two legs. Now, the idea that a wolf 
could live, you know, an un, there could be an unknown type of wolf in the United States which is able to walk on two legs and four legs. Sounds totally bizarre, but incredibly, it's actually not impossible. And I'll explain why. That's a, a creature from uh, the known as the um, the Tasmanian uh, wolf, uh, and also the thylacine. And this existed on Australia and Tasmania. Uh, reportedly, the last case, or the last surviving relic, um, was killed or died in the 1930s. Now, many people claim to have seen the thylacine um, since the 1930s, and I'm pretty much sure, if probably 99% sure, they do still exist. Now, they kind of look like a wolf, perhaps crossed with, almost if you look at the back, it looks like a cross between a wolf and a tiger, and who knows what else. But the, um, the thylacine is actually, or was actually a marsupial, which means its closest living relative was actually a kangaroo, um, even though it looks dog-like. Um, now, as I said, they reportedly became extinct in the 1930s, but there are still many reports made today. But what's interesting is that the thylacine could actually rear itself up onto its hind legs and had this strange hopping movement where it could actually hop along on its back legs. And I'll just, I'll read you a quote from the official Australian government's website on the thylacine. The thylacine was said to have an awkward way of moving, trotting stiffly and not moving particularly quickly. They walked on their toes like a dog, but could also move in a more unusual way, a bipedal hop. The animal would stand upright with its front legs in the air, resting its hind legs on the ground and using its tail as a support exactly the way a kangaroo, kangaroo does. Thylacines have been known to hop for short distances in this position. So, if you imagine, you know, you're sort of driving or walking down the road late at night in the woods, and you see something like that, standing on its hind legs, hopping along with its front limbs like this, glaring at you and snarling, you thought, your first thought would probably would be a werewolf because everybody has that image of a werewolf, like with a long muzzle, the pointed ears, covered in fur, and if it's on four limbs, you can just think it's a wolf. If it's walking towards you or hopping towards you on, on its back legs, that really changes the situation. So, bear in mind that that's what I just read out. That's the official statement of the Australian government, you know, the, the, the creature hopped along on its back legs, which just sounds bizarre. Um, it makes me wonder, could there be something similar living in the United States to the thylacine that we don't know about? Some sort of unknown, unknown creature similar to the thylacine that could rear itself up on its hind legs, probably for intimidation. Because a lot of people have said when they've seen these so-called werewolves, it, it, the creature's actually been on four limbs. And then when the creature has seen the person, it rears itself up. It's kind of like a way to intimidate and frighten the person. And it probably does a good job of doing both. Um, so I don't think, you know, we're dealing with at all, I want to stress, I don't think we're dealing at all with people who sprout hair and fangs and turn into werewolves. I, I don't think that's even feasible. So the biology that would be needed to chain, transfer the bone and the muscle and everything else from a four-legged animal to a two-legged animal, it's just impossible. But I do think we could be onto something with this theory that there is a, an unknown type of canine in the forest of the US which may have the ability to rear itself up like the thylacine did. So I hope that's kind of given you a bit of insight into uh, the weird creatures of Texas. And that's just a, a short list. There are literally dozens and dozens of different ones. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'll be uh, glad to answer them. Thanks a lot.